In this video I will ask Professor Paul Hazel from the University of New South Wales Canberra some basic questions about armor design and armor materials. To give you a basic idea of what awaits you, here are the different questions I ask for the individual timestamps, check the description and YouTube chapter system. I hope you enjoy this episode and learn something. Be sure to post any questions in the comment section, we might cover them in the future. So when we go back to the basics, what are the main factors in armor and material design which we have to look at for armor of a, of a tank? Okay, well, that, that's a, a fairly broad question. Um, there, there, there's probably no single issue that, you know, or no single property that you would want in a, um, an armor system because the you you have to look at an armor system as a system well, as a system you know so it's it's, a, um, it's it's made up of multiple elements and each of those elements play a role in defeating a specific type of projectile if you want to look at a simple armor structure that's say designed to defeat a um, uh, you know a, a, an APDS type projectile then we we know that you know strength hardness um are very important properties and actually if you look at the you know hardness of ceramics and we come back to ceramics again i mean ceramics are um will be used in in tank armor uh, for sure um the way uh, ceramics offer that sort of resilience and that resistance to penetration by virtue of their high strength and high hardness and compression. Of course, they have a, an Achilles heel in that the, they, they um, are susceptible to brittle fracture. Um, and, and that, you know, we can use that against the projectile as well. Some heat rounds, we can use that. Um, we, we sometimes use glass, for example, to defeat heat rounds because we know that the glass has a sort of a magical spring back of, uh, ability as well. Um, and so it brings back the crater and all that kind of comminuted and fragmented material into the path of the jet as it's starting to penetrate through. So, so that there are there are sort of several, um, I suppose, there's, there's different um, ways of, of defeating projectiles, and we'd use different properties. But, but in summary, I think you know strength and harness they're they're the two uh, which are synonymous together, aren't they? They go hand in hand together. What what is exactly strength? I have a basic idea what hardness is, but but when it comes to strength, it's like uh, I'm I'm a bit baffled. What what right. is what so, is? Um, so I suppose that the way that we would would talk about strength is in in terms of a laboratory a lab, laboratory test. Uh, excuse me. Um, so and you know strength is a is a number. And it's uh, it represents where a, for example, there's, there's different measures of, of strength. So yield strength, for example, is where we move from elastic behavior to plastic behavior. So you think of a, a metal that's being pulled apart uh, using a conventional um, tensile test. We pull the metal apart. It will initially behave elastically has a Young's modulus of about 210 gigapascals. So it's stretched elas elastically for a very, very uh, small uh, distance. And then we'll start to see permanent deformation or um, um, sort of plastic flow. And so it's the transition between the elastic response and the plastic response. And there's actually physical mechanisms that we could go into which describe that that plastic, you know, that plasticity process, which we probably don't have time to um, uh, on this on this talk, but it is a kind of a, a, a transition between elastic and plastic behaviour. Um, one, you know, one of the kind of aspect that we also need to think about when we're talking about um, protection and armour is not only the elastic to plastic transition, but also the fact that you you get what we call strain rate hardening. So there is not only strain hardening, which you get by virtue of the fact that you're, you know, you're stretching the material, but you also get strain rate hardening. So when a projectile strikes a target, then we know that that, that, that target and that projectile is undergoing deformation at high rates of strain. And that, not in not uh, all cases, but generally will lead to a kind of an increase 
in the uh, the plastic uh, behavior of that material. So there's hardness and elas elasticity and so, basic it is strength basically the combination of both. Well, no, hmm, uh, so so when we talk about elasticity, we're talking about where we are um, compressing the, should we say, the lattice of the material. So if we, we had a really, really powerful microscope and we could zoom in on the, the actual position of the atoms, um, most armor materials, apart from the obvious uh, polymers and, and so on, um, would have a would be of a polycrystalline form. So that means that they would comprise of atoms that would position with their own kind of uh, respective order. When you elastically compress those materials, then you, the, you actually compress them. So you're not actually damaging that that lattice right down at the atomic level. There's there's no damage to the structure. However, when you kind of get to that level of, of plastic deformation, that's where you start to get um, damage to that, that at the lattice level and you start to see um, you know, permanent deformation occurring, which isn't going to be recovered unless you put sort of energy back into the material right through heating and that, that type of thing. So sometimes we can do what's called recrystallization after, um, after sort of plastically working materials to, to get them to recover. In, in terms of hardness, is it measured in Brunel or is this just one way to measure it? So, so Brunel is just one uh, way of, of measuring hardness. Uh, you can, there's, there, there are multiple um, values. And again, hardness is just a number, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a number that gives you an indication of how hard or how soft. So there's the Vickers hardness number, there's the Brunel hardness number, there's the Noop hardness number, there's, um, is the Rockwell, uh, Rockwell B and C um, hardness numbers, and uh, and so on and so forth. So you know you, the, each of those uh, tests are slightly different, and will give you a slightly different number, but you can actually read across those those scales. So so even though you've got multiple uh, different um, ways of measuring hardness, you can actually um, you know you can uh, read across them. Um, and actually, you can you can actually uh, calculate the ultimate tensile strength of a metal based upon, for example, the Brunel hardness number. We'll give an, uh, get an estimate, a good estimate anyway. Now, you you mentioned in the beginning um, uh, armor against APFDS, and when we look at the regular armor piercing. Um, projectile, is it then that hardness and elasticity are more important? Like, because I, I remember for the second World War the channel, I noted, um, like, I think the Germans used face hardening, that the front of the armor was hard, but yeah. the, the back of the steel was still, was not hard no. to, to yeah. keep that elasticity. Yeah, no, no, no. So, so it, it wasn't to keep it um, elastic. It was to make sure that uh, there, there was a um, there was a hard face which um, which provided resistance to penetration, uh, and then uh, behind that hard face there was a, a tough uh, zone of material. It was still going to be plastically worked during the ballistic penetration, so it is the strength of the material. So so we're kind of now looking at another kind of aspect, I suppose, that we've got uh, not only the magnitude. Uh, in terms of the value, but also the, the the amount of ductility that your armor can offer you. So if we do a conventional, and maybe what I should do is draw you out a, a sort of little diagram of a stress-strain curve, we could actually look at the elastic response, the plastic response. Uh, there's two important parameters there. There's the magnitude of the strength, but also there's the area underneath that curve which is um, a measure of the toughness. And in fact, it's the energy absorbed per unit volume for a kind of a conventional tensile test that we would do in a university laboratory. So it's basically um, what, what the Germans were doing with their face hardened armor, which was, uh, um, you know, was implemented on the Tiger, for example. Um, they, the, what they would do is they would have a, um, 
you'd have a very uh, hard face of, of a few millimeters and that would act as a disrupting layer to the projectile. In other words, that would kind of blunt the projectile or cause it to, to fracture. Then behind that, that uh, um, disrupting layer, which would, which would be prone to cracking, would be the tough zone in the metal. And that would then allow for the energy absorption in terms of, of um, think of it in terms of trying to capture the projectile. In reality, what you're trying to do is, is that you would, you would, the, that material would be stretching to accommodate the ballistic penetration. But in doing so, it would be taking out kinetic energy out of the projectile. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a good way of. If I were to use that concept um, today, like a disruptor absorber type of approach in, in armor system design. So, so basically, if it was completely hardened everywhere, the 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 chances that the armor would break itself would be way too high. Yes. Yeah. Generally speaking. So, so for example, you know, we mentioned ceramics earlier. Um, you would never use a ceramic tile on its own. And the reason for that is because, you know, that's, that's hard everywhere in the tile. Um, and if the projectile punched through that, then what it would just shatter. It might, sure, it might provide a certain degree of resistance, but, um, you know, the, the crack propagation, the kind of explosion of the material would probably mean it would, um, unless it was heavily confined, it would disappear on um, into, you know, behind the, the armor. Thank you very much for your insights and time. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Um, it was uh, good fun talking to you, Bernard. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.